Within the Marxian tradition, not only is there the essentialism of rationalism and empiricism that Marx and others struggled against, but that's present within that tradition as well. But there's also this essentialist theory of society in which economics is deemed the most important cause. Okay. Marx, and especially Engels, had the following idea. They thought society could be decomposed into the following kind of uh, metaphor. At the base of society, so let me draw this, at the base of society was economics. And the rest of society was built upon this base. So here was economics, the foundation of society, the ground for society, and up here was everything else which they called the superstructure, politics, and culture. So politics and culture rest upon, are caused by economics. You can see where this is going to go. In economics, there were two parts of the economy which were the ultimate cause of all of economics and the ultimate cause, hence, of, of the superstructure. In here, I'll put it down here, in the base, there were two. One was relations of production and the other forces of production. Two aspects of the base determined the rest of the economy, you know, the circulation, the markets, and so forth, which in turn then determined everything else. So these, you can see these are no minor causes. Relations of production had to do with who owns what. So the distribution of ownership over the means of production, the tools, the factories, was the relations of production. The forces had to do with how we produce, the technology of society. So Marx, and especially Engels, argued that the interaction between the relations and the forces of production determines the economy, which in determines everything else. And this is called, in the literature, economic determinism. Notice the adjective. There is an ultimate causation in society, which is that of economics. In everything else, how we, uh, the music that we play, uh, uh, the literature that we see, the advertising, um, the, the production and circulation of goods, is ultimately grounded in the relations and for forces of production. That was so important that they put a label on this, and it was called the mode of production. So the idea was that the mode of production is the ultimate cause. It's the essence of society. So if you understand how the mode operates, the relations and forces, you understand everything. That's a powerful theory. That's really modernism. <laughs> you, you, you know, you have now the, t the, the, the two essential aspects and the tools with which and by which they figure out what is really going on. That's their modernist theory. Notice, however, that violates the dialectic, this notion of overdetermination. Because we've found the ultimate causes, we've found the two essences, relations and forces. So even when Engels uh, and Marx went to work in presenting this, it wasn't too long after they did this. If I remember correctly, Marx had just died. And so someone writes Engels and says to him, Mr. Engels, <coughs> as students of history, referring to Engels and Marx, you, you I'm paraphrasing because I don't exactly remember it, but you, as students of history, you understand that the politics and culture of society shape the mode of production. I mean, it, causation goes that way too. You, I mean, it would be silly to think that the mode of production, our relations and forces, are independent of the way we think, our laws and rules and so forth. And Engels writes back and says, you're right. I understand that what I think is this ultimate cause is itself caused ED. And he had to say that because Engels was a student of the dialectic. But then Engels answered that letter by saying, I understand this, but I think how this causation works is determined in the last instance by economics. And that's been called ever since determination in the last instance by economics. But this is a trick that Engels play because he defends, he accepts the critique 
that the mode of production is an effect of the superstructure. You know, so he accepts that. But then he attacks it by saying that the way the superstructure causes the motor production is itself caused by the motor production. Okay? So, to make a long story short, he's still affirming a kind of essentialism. And that problem, that economic determinism, has been a problem within the Marxian tradition ever since Marx and Engels presented it. So for the last 130 years, the, the people have been struggling over this, and that's in your reading. Um, and it has very, very important implications across the 20th century in the actually in these, in these uh, uh, socialist experiments that were adopted starting with the Soviet Union, many of which, if not all of which, adopted this kind of economic determinism. The last uh, part of this uh, lecture, what I want to talk about, um, which I said we would, is this uh, uh, few pages in which Marx presents his method. That's in the assigned uh, reading. So I want to talk about, because it's a good summary um, of how what we have done here before uh, bears upon this. Uh, and in, in this reading, Marx presents uh, two kinds of concretes, the thought-concrete and the uh, concrete-real. The, the, the wording is difficult here. The thought-concrete is a result of theorizing. So you think of people thinking and they produce a theory of society. He calls that the thought concrete. The concrete real refers to reality or the word that was used in his day, materiality. Okay. Marx theorizes the concrete real as a totality as a site of determinations emanating from political, economic, and cultural, and natural processes. Hence, he produces a particular thought concrete of the concrete real, which is, I'm going to use not his language, our language, which is an overdetermined totality which exists in, contra in, in contradiction. I'm, I'm using what we just uh, talked about. Okay, that's the way Marx produces his thought concrete of reality. So once again, reality is the site of these different determinations which are pushing and pulling in different directions, hence it exists in change. One response to, the, to these contradictions, that's one response to the diverse uh, determinations which emanate from society for materiality on us, is our thinking. So the concrete real feeds back and affects how we think. I mean, what do we have now? Have you really put it together? We produce thought concretes as human beings about how society and nature exist, how it impacts us and so forth. Okay, so our thinking, our thought concretes, which are a result of our thinking, help to create the concrete real in two ways. Our thinking is part, or our thought concretes are part of the concrete real. So to think and to change the way we think shapes the concrete real because we are changing one aspect in the concrete real, which is our thoughts, our theories. But it also changes everything else in the, in the concrete real because everything else is a complex uh, effect of how we think. So to think and to change our thinking impacts society, or the, this concrete real, in these two ways. It changes something out there and it changes everything else out there because everything else interacts with our thinking and hence it creates impacts upon us. So we're left with the following idea, which the ceaseless dialectic of life, what's this called? To change a thought concrete, which don't forget what that is now, to change a particular theorization of the world, is to change the world in these two ways. And, this, and that change in the world feeds back to change our thinking. And you have this ceaseless dialectic of life in which 
thought concrete and concrete real shape one another. Neither one is independent of the other. Hence, neither one can serve as the essence of the other, and that's another attack on rationalism and empiricism. And that's the end of today's presentation.